Hey guys, it is July the 13th. We're almost to the middle of the month and it is, as per usual, a fun day in the markets. Um, we are going, let me share my screen in just a second. Um, past performance is not indicative of future returns. And with that, let's do this. Okay, this is Finviz, one of my favorites. Again, one day I gotta try to get a promo from them, but at the same time, this is pretty fantastic and spectacular here, mixed market, even though mostly red going into earnings season. Um, we are gonna, and, and then on the indices, just to set the context, we are at midday fairly correcting from a initial red bloody morning. So everything's almost flat at this point, but I'm gonna tell you, even though I know um, it, a lot of the technicals are suggesting that we have a bounce from here. I think you got to be really, really careful. So let me show you what I'm seeing. Today's agenda, I thought I'd do this to kind of make it a little simpler because I keep forgetting stuff, but we're going to talk about the VIX really quick, tomorrow, uh, tomorrow's econ or the economic data in general. And earnings season, two companies reporting this morning, which is really Delta and Fastenal, and then CPI. And so... CPI came in weaker than expected. It went great. And I'm going to tell, I'm going to actually go through some of those numbers, but remember we still have retail sales. Now, why should the market actually react a bit more aggressively, even though these are typically numbers that the market definitely does react to? It's because we're trying to figure out what's going on with the consumer. How are they doing? How's it going? Because that's legitimately the one pillar that the entire U.S. economy has been like we're holding everybody up. We're not just holding the U.S. up anymore. That part is clear. Um, the markets are telling you that as it as it places the euro and the U.S. dollar at parity. I have a cute little Instagram post on my stories if you want to take a look at that um, about that. But for the first time, the um, the strength of the dollar has increased so aggressively relative to the weakness in the euro, which is something I've been talking about and is why I keep saying, hey. Short the EWG, uh, specifically Germany is my preference because of the nature of what's in that basket. If you short the MSCI Euro, Europe index, that's probably fine too. It's just really take a look at the top names in there because a few of them are food manufacturers. My preference is Germany because those top names are industrial and also auto manufacturer, which I think is gonna have a rough time in the particular environment that has been created overseas. So um, that, but retail sales is really gonna give you a good sense for what's happening. Now I will say that CPI gave us a ton of clues with that, but I do wanna remind you that tomorrow starts the massive onslaught of financial earnings report. And so whatever happens today, I have already set up, but you can continue to set up um, your, Put, uh, strangles on tomorrow. Like I, it could go literally one way or the other. And that is because it is actually that potentially problematic, which way it could go. You know, like, yes, interest rates rose, net interest margins, however, because of the shape of the curve have flattened relative to the first few announcements, but we're embedding the whole quarter and then we're thinking about guidance. So it's unclear what the banks will come out and say in guidance. It's unclear whether or not they were able to make money this last quarter if they did something stupid. We know that investment banking revenues were weak, so they really have to make it up on trading. But then the um, difference between whether it was institutional trading volumes that did it or whether it was retail, is going to be everything all over the map and then some. And this is really banks, proper banks, and then asset managers. That's what BlackRock, State Street, et cetera, and custodian State Street has uh, got both the asset manager custodian business, but um, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, et cetera, they have four different business lines. Anyways, the point is, is that you don't, because certain parts of the bank are gonna do okay, and it's whether or not they'll compensate for other parts of the bank. And some people are like, oh, it's priced in. No, it's not. Because if things get really rough, Actually, it's very hard to do a concept of priced in within the banks. So like I said, strangles on the XLF is actually a reasonable thing to do. Alternatively, um, you know, you could buy puts on any one of these banks that you feel like might be interesting because the correlation risk will be high. Um, possibly, um, I mean, 
I have some that I like versus some that I don't like just because I always have certain biases towards certain towards certain um, banks. Like I habitually always am not a fan of, J of Wells Fargo. Sorry, folks that work at Wells Fargo, it's nothing personal. It's just that your last quarter's numbers came off the private equity business, not off of the strength and awesomeness of the bank itself. So I still think he's got a lot to work through at Wells Fargo, um, but you know that would be the one that I would buy puts on even though in fairness, all of them have kind of this weird valuation. So it's possible that they just do nothing as well. But if you've got to hedge your book, that's where I would look to hedge is really in the financials. Um, you could, the Delta Airlines had a really interesting call, which we'll go into, but I do want to go through CPI first. So this is CPI. And because we're in this really awkward phase, you do actually have to go through and read the release. And so I want to show you a few things. Food up 1%. If you look at like how it's been trending, and I've told you like um, starting last quarter, the food companies were no longer able to hold the line. They had to like pass it through to the retailers and the retailers had to figure it out. And so the, there's not as much margin cushion between like the food providers like a Procter Gamble, the farmer, and also the retailer. You know, throughout the last few quarters, one of those three has been able to eat it, for lack of a better way to describe it. But we're moving into this period where that's just not the case. That's what, to me, the CPI number is saying. And that's part of the reason why you're finally getting positive momentum on the fertilizer stocks, which have been clobbered because fertilizer pricing went down with seasonality as it's expected to do. But I think we're getting a lot more headlines that demonstrate exactly how much of this crop is not going to come out of the Ukraine uh, Belarus region and exactly what that's implying to a number of nations that are all aggressively negotiating grain deals with like literally whoever has grain this this next um, uh, you know fall or what have you. So it's it's an ugly situation. Add to that, the droughts have not improved. And I got to tell you, agriculture is probably the most exciting this last year. And I think it's going to be exciting for the next year or so. And um, I will promote tomorrow, if we have a little extra time or whenever there's a quiet time, a couple of resources that I watch regularly on YouTube. I think there's actually, I think it's called Ag Daily or something, Agriculture Daily. She does an amazing job and she's really smart on giving you the day by day of what's going on. But the ag complex, largely speaking as a whole, is going to go up. And that really has to do with something we've been saying, which is gross exposure came down. And because gross exposure was biased long, it looks a particular way. But as far as fundamentals go, we're still in a state of shortage across the entire agriculture complex. There's not one place where we have surplus or we're expecting Mother Nature to help us out at this particular juncture. So just realize that. Okay. Um, Commodities, you can kind of see gas up 11%, still like crazy high from May to June. Now we'll see how the end of, you know, this is really um, not telling us how things are going on the forward curve and what's going to go thereafter. This really reflects this crazy spot price that we've had in that gas. So just realize that um, if we're really thinking the worst is over with inflation, we really are going to have to see it um, next month. But I think that's overstated. If anything, my suspicion is we won't see it till after August when demand actually try, starts to slow down seasonally. Electricity, those bills are going up aggressively and you can see like pipe, piped gas, meaning like if you get a mix of electricity and gas in your house, that's up a lot. And it has been for the last two quarters in line with what we're seeing just in gasoline usage, but you can kind of see that dynamic. Okay, autos is actually an, an intriguing dynamic because now we're in the second month of up versus used cars being down. So this really speaks to what we've been saying all along. We're out of cars, okay? Let me be really crystal clear. We entered COVID last two years ago with the oldest fleet. There's like measurements for this, meaning that the average age of a car versus divided by population, et cetera, or adjusted for population, the average age of car was older than it's usually been. Just to remind you, even at the rental car level, a car that is older than seven years is fully depreciated on the balance sheet of a, of a rental car company. Now, there are new um, apps that are coming out like Toro. I, I rented a car from Toro. I had a wonderful experience. And there you'll see cars that are a little bit older. But uh, just realize that this um, whole dynamic has 
a range of really strange and bizarre implications, not the least of which is for companies that are used car sales companies, because it implies that the insurance that you're charging and what the recovery rate and then required maintenance and, and stuff like that, it's not great. I'm gonna go through cars a little bit more just to show you what I mean a little further. And then shelter is still ticking up at a faster rate. Um, so this really is part of why if you're in housing and REITs, just watch that one like a hawk because this is really rental rates and then they make an adjustment for people that have houses. And then transport services, this is where you would fix your car, is up a lot, okay? 1.3, now 2.3, but every single month it's been trending upwards and that's because people are just having their cars for longer and also people are starting to drive again. So whereas transport services last year, you had less people on the roads, now you've got more people on the roads and there is a very direct relationship between mileage driven and how much you have to fix your car. Okay, there is a further breakout in this. So I wanted to show you this breakout and one other breakout, but if there's a specific industry that you care about, the CPI number this quarter, excuse me, this month was very interesting. Here is the breakout. You can see it's both new and used cars, but also parts and accessories. Parts is down seven on the year, but up 2.6, okay? For a while, the parts business, your um, AutoNation, uh, O'Reilly, et cetera, had been really getting clobbered because you've got like down 0.7 and they've all talked about supply chain. We've had a little bit of alleviation on that this month. Will it be enough? Because this is June, May, et cetera. This three represents the quarter. It still shows um, quite down quite a bit on the year. But just realize that vehicle parts is still kind of this gray area of what's going to happen. However, maintenance is another story. We're seeing really good numbers on motor vehicle repair um, this quarter in particular, so or this last month in particular. So it may be that we're coming out of this you know, uh, slump that they received last quarter on being able to get parts so they could then fix your car. Um, hard to say. But that is, that is what the number showed for those that care about automobiles. And then alcohol, interestingly enough, it's been a while since I've invested in Molson Coors. In fairness, I think the CEO has done a really good job. He's a new CEO they put in. Um, I think he's like an Aussie. And then the CFO is also this wonderful Australian woman. But this actually bodes pretty well. Looks like people are drinking at home more than they're drinking out. You know, no judgment. Um, but at the same time, that's what I'm seeing. And then they're hitting the light booze versus the heavy booze a bit heavier. So you can kind of see how that's going. But um, but definitely uh, this bodes well for things like Budweiser, Molson Coors, things like that. Um, now, I want to talk about Delta because the, the stock traded down, which was awesome because like I said yesterday, I covered out the long side of it because it's hard sometimes with these earnings to know which way it'll trade. And I also bought puts and turned things into a strangle where I could. So I lifted the whole position. In fairness, this is being reported as if it wasn't a good quarter because there was some awkwardness with guidance. But in fact, this was a great quarter, in my opinion, relative to how I saw the numbers. Part of it is because right now the airlines are reporting relative to 2019. That's their prerogative. The street wants to see it this way. But if you really examine what's happening here, if you compare it to 2021, you're going to see almost a double across all revenue types like what is that, uh, seven to 13 is almost like 80% up. So, so you are getting big um, boost of numbers. And then if you look at the operating income down at the bottom, 1.5 versus eight, it's, it's like a fairly significantly large increase, which means the airlines are absolutely both increasing volume and getting pricing through as relates to gas charges, et cetera. Okay, I had said that, that was the reason why I feel like these are a little bit undervalued, but the market wants to sell and I don't like to fight the tape. So it's unnecessary, um, but just realize that does bode well. If you're thinking, oh, Delta was down on the morning, I'm going to short American and United, that would be the wrong call. Okay, so um, I also want to show you, though, the more interesting things in this. Cargo was up like, you know, 50%, and they were like, this is record cargo. Everybody focuses on that, but I could care less. The only thing I cared about with Delta was this number, other, because this number, other, is mostly their refining business. So this number, other, is part of the reason why you're seeing so many companies in oil and gas up today that have any remote part of their business in refining, because this tells you 100% that they benefited from refining margins, and they said it on the call. So that's what I would have to say there. 
Um, this bodes very positively for my pipelines, but I, you know, I'm long right now because the, the calls are so darn cheap. I'm long Kinder Morgan, I'm long Williams. I'm also long, um, I think I'm long, but I have to double check if it actually trade went through, uh, Marathon, MPC, because those are all refiners. Um, and also, by the way, I've mentioned this before, Icon Enterprises, one of the biggest revenue uh, pieces of that business right now is the um, refinery that's embedded within it. It's a huge component and it's been growing like crazy. And it's part of why they're able to give you back that 16% dividend yield right now. So realize Icon, all of this bodes really well for all of those companies of the group that I just mentioned. I always love Kinder Morgan because I just think Rich Kinder is such a badass for lack of a better way to say it. But in fairness, Kinder Morgan sometimes has infrastructure issues when the weather goes crazy in Texas. And we've had like the craziest weather in Texas. So that one I think is a little more controversial. Um, so I just mentioned that. And that's all I have for now. Let me stop sharing and take questions. That was a lot. <laughs> hey, May, um, excellent. Um, how fat, I mean, how easy is it to convert from oil to coal, for example, for Germany, for Europe. For Germany? Oh, Germany just has to open back up its utility plants. That's really the major way. Oil is not typically used in utilities, so it's really about um, how exactly do they want to use that oil for heating. Like, you know what I mean? Like for the winter, if you look at the mix, um, oil is only used, like we have heating oil, of course, right? That's a different animal. But um, oil, and, and it really, like, to be fair, I don't, I, you know, Europe, I always, I always tell you what I know and what I don't know. And so I don't know how much heating oil versus electricity is used, uh, classic forms of electricity um, are used to heat homes in Europe. But in the Northeast here, we use heating oil. So there's that, you know, that, that infrastructure, wherever it exists, just exists. Um, but my suspicion is since they're saying they're gonna supplement with oil, then they're actually doing something to the oil, either refining it, um, or or something else. So I don't I don't know the answer to that. It's it's a really strange thing, um, but I don't think it's that hard. With coal, that one's easy. You just start, I mean it's not easy. But you still you have a bunch of old coal fired uh, utilities that uh, uh, sites that you can just get back up and running, and you have until the winter months to do it. Right. Okay. It looks to me like I mean. Putin is really in the driver's seat as far as winter goes. Oh, yeah. This is ugly. I mean, like, and like we were saying yesterday, the tell for that is the fact that every other country that is just not involved or has tried to stay out of it. So, like, most of Latin America, we're seeing all of Asia. They're like, hey, so we're, um, you want to sell some oil? Like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They're not like, oh, this is going to resolve itself you know, you're going to like keep your prices at a certain price. They're like, yeah, so um, oil's at the, you know, you, you know, oil farther out the curve is sub 90. I, I'm happy to buy that. You know what I mean? That is very telling. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Great, great presentation. All right. Take care, guys. See you tomorrow. Good luck out there.